Welcome back to the Computer Hardware and OS Essentials lecture series. I created these custom lectures based on A plus certification program, but with few enhancements to improve IT technical skills and knowledge. If you haven't seen my previous lectures, I will post a link in the description for the playlist. This would be our third lecture and I will go over motherboards. In this lesson, we will cover what is a motherboard. So what we would we consider as a motherboard? We will go over basic fundamentals such as different types of motherboards, form factors, features such as chipsets, processor options, expansion slots, etc. And we will describe and contrast laptop, desktop and server motherboards. We will go over some typical BIOS UEFI settings and configurations. In my future lectures, I will cover more uh, items associated with motherboards, including RAM and hard drives. So what is a motherboard? You could look at motherboard as the most complicated component of, of your device because it is a printed circuit board containing the physical components of a computer or other device with connectors into which other circuit boards can be slotted. So it not only provide the backbone for your device, it also allow you to add additional components onto your device. So it is a the most complicated component and it provides support for other components. So motherboard by definition is the heart of the entire computer so it is the backbone you could look at the backbone of your entire computer so what about father boards son boards or daughter boards uh, do they exist well yes they do especially the daughter boards uh, they are expans uh, expansive uh, boards uh, that extend the capacity of the motherboard so the daughter boards would allow the motherboard's capabilities to be expanded outside of what is it is originally uh, set up as. However, these daughter boards are typically, uh, you know, associated with um, uh, servers, but desktops also do come with uh, these kind of uh, daughter boards as well. Keep in mind, what makes a motherboard a motherboard is that the fact that it is the backbone of your computer. So if somebody asks you what is the definition of a motherboard, you could use the terms it is the most complicated component, computer component and it is basically the backbone of your entire device. So the motherboard is a printed circuit board uh, that has all the principal components of, a, of that device. Therefore, it is the backbone of your entire device. So let's look at laptops, desktop and server boards uh, as an overall big picture. So how they are different and how they are the same. So that's the question that you should be asking when you look at these boards. So if you look at the form factors, you can see that the laptop boards, and this is a tip, example of a typical laptop board, uh, the form factor it may change depending on the design of your laptop. Like in this case, for example, there might be a fan or some kind of a other device component attached right here. So as a result, they don't have enough room to print this circuit board, This uh, made this printed circuit board in a square form, format. So they have cut out a piece and designed this motherboard in a way that it would fit, fit into your laptop. So the laptop boards are typically custom designed to your laptop so that all the component can fit into that confined space. Laptop boards typically also use uh, as, uh, you know, little components as needed and as smaller, uh, you know, as uh, smaller versions of the components as possible. Like for example, in here we have a RAM and this type of RAM uh, slots are different from that of these RAM slots that you see down here with the server boards and the desktop board. The reason for that is, is again to sp save space. So sp space saving is very important with laptop boards and therefore they are very compact 
and often time custom design and have these custom design cutouts so that it would fit in with other components of your laptop. Compare that with the desktop boards or server boards, they are typically in square or rectangular designs. So it looks like this or look like that at the server board. And they are much larger than that of the laptop boards. Unfortunately, all of these three images doesn't have any um, scales associated with it. So laptop board is, boards are typically smaller and the desktop boards are much larger and the, the server boards are much, much larger typically. So if you look at the desktop board, uh, it, um, you know, it will have a different type of RAM, which I will discuss in a different separate lecture. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is a, a RAM bank associated with typically one CPU. It will also have expansion slots such as PCIe and PCIe, uh, uh, you know, expansion slots for addition of um, cards such as your GPU cards, uh, network cards if you need extra network uh, support, etc, etc. The server boards uh, have multiple uh, RAM uh, support. So we have multiple RAM banks, so memory banks, and typically have more than one CPU. Please keep in mind, some server boards, uh, especially built for small businesses, may only have one CPU. So desktop um, servers usually comes with one CPU uh, installed, uh, but uh, even desktop uh, servers um, can have uh, multiple CPUs uh, if the correct motherboard is uh, installed. But typically, servers have more than one CPU, just, just like shown here. Because servers can support multiple CPUs, in this example, four CPUs, as a result, they would also have multiple memory banks. So those mem mem this, these memories is actually associated with each of these CPUs. And therefore, uh, you know, it's, it is, um, the, the workload is divided among these four CPUs and these uh, uh, memory uh, banks. Keep in mind, again, even though this memory, these memory banks looks very similar to that of the uh, desktop memory banks, they are completely different. These are called ECC memory, and these are called, you know, the, these are other memory, uh, you know, these are different DDR memory uh, that are different type. Again, I will go over what are the differences between memory on a different lecture. So for now, just remember the memory is different among uh, the desktop, uh, laptop, and server boards as well. Also, if you look at input output uh, components uh, that is already built into the uh, boards, uh, the server board typically have more uh, network support. Like for example, in here, we have multiple network connections compared to the laptops and desktop boards typically would have one LAN uh, connector or network interface card, a NIC output uh, on each of these uh, device, each of these boards compared to the server boards because server boards have multiple network interfaces right here shown here. However, um, it is possible to add uh, additional network ports uh, if needed uh, for a desktop board, uh, but not uh, typically on a laptop board because there is no expansion slots such as the PCIe slots available on the laptop board. Another key difference between a server board compared to a desktop and a a laptop board uh, would be that it uh, sometimes comes with built-in RAID support um, or uh, in most cases we would add a RAID support by adding a RAID card on top of it. Uh, however, if you look at uh, the, the desktop board, um, you can um, add RAID using the expansion slot here. Uh, however, uh, it is not a key component of a desktop board. Modern desktop boards somehow uh, sometimes do come with RAID support built in, where you have multiple SATA connections, where you can configure them as uh, RAID, but however, um, they are not as capable as that of a server board because server is a purpose-built board, right? So servers are purpose-built board. So the CPU, RAM, storage, networking, everything purpose-built to work as a powerhouse 
for work uh, workload that it needs to handle uh, with this uh, with uh, associated with servers again this is a just a high level overview there are many many differences among these boards uh, but just remember uh, these are some key differences between a laptop desktop and a server board motherboard form factors server motherboards are available in a variety of form factors which are just specifications dictating a motherboard size shape mounting holes power supply and other features these include eatx atx micro atx SSI CEB, SSI EEB, SSI MEB, COM Express, or even manufacturer's custom form factor. So, server boards are a little bit more complicated than that of a, a desktop or a laptop boards when it's come to the point, uh, you know, designs, uh, because uh, you may have custom uh, form factors as well. Desktop motherboards are typically comes in ATX, micro ATX, mini ITX, also known as MITX. But again, uh, there are other varieties that, uh, that are available in the market that includes like Excel ATX, as well as some custom form factors. Uh, those usually uh, you would find it in places like uh, Dell gaming uh, motherboards. Uh, they have their own custom uh, form factor. I'm not a big fan of custom uh, desktop form factors, especially for consumer level, uh, because that would limit a consumer's ability to repair. I believe in right to repair uh, movement, uh, and therefore I actually highly discourage people from buying uh, Dell gaming uh, desktops because they usually come with custom motherboards and you won't be able to use the case for anything else Not that most scenarios most customers would do that, but I don't like the fact that uh, you know Manufacturers do that. So keep that in mind uh, You might uh, end up with a custom form factor motherboard especially from organizations such as Dell but if you look at um, the standard motherboards, uh, you have, um, you know, the a uh, sorry, XL ATX, uh, E ATX, standard ATX, micro ATX, and ITX. And if you look at them uh, in terms of size perspective, uh, this is what uh, you would get. So the, here's a pen uh, right here for the scale. And you can see this reference was taken out from another website. You can go there and check it out, the article. and. Um, the ITX is the smallest for, uh, form factor for desktop motherboards and then uh, the biggest form factor for uh, standard uh, ma uh, you know uh, motherboards would be the XL ATX and what typically you would get in the market is the standard ATX which should be this one but however all of these items uh, you know uh, are considered as standard uh, motherboard sizes for your desktop PC uh, motherboard. So this is what you would get for desktops. So here is the overall picture of motherboard uh, form factors, uh, especially for desktops. And um, you can see if you put uh, the ATX, micro ATX and mini ATX on top of each other, uh, these are the differences you're going to see. So the mini ATX would have 170 millimeter and then the micro ATX and ATX would have 220 uh, 244 millimeter in terms of um, you know depth and then uh, in the other direction you will get 244 millimeter for mini ATX uh, sorry uh, for micro ATX and 305 uh, millimeter for the ATX uh, so uh, mini ATX is a square so it's going to be 170 by 170 so 170 millimeter this way and 170 millimeter that way uh, but uh, in micro ATX is going to be 170 by 244 and the ATX is going to be uh, two, uh, 244 by uh, 305. So that's how it's, um, you know, uh, sorry, uh, the micro ATX is going to be uh, uh, 244 by 244. Uh, again, it's a square, but the ATX is going to be 244 by 305. So that's how these two are squares. Uh, and this is a like a rectangle. On the right hand side, here's another diagram that somebody created. That also shows mounting uh, positions uh, or those uh, mounting stands associated with uh, different motherboards. So you would have these mounting stands right here, for example, these yellow ones, and that would be associated 
with the micro ATX. So this would be the micro ATX and you will have an IO which is the input output um, uh, you know um, items right here and the motherboard would fit in like that for micro ATX. For ATX it would fit in like this right here that would be the ATX and um, if you have uh, SSI uh, CEB board uh, like the server boards um, they are typically server boards and they I would have fit in like that and uh, uh, so on and so forth so this will give you a contrast of different boards uh, shown on top of each other and uh, there's the mounting positions like for example these mounting positions also changes as the board uh, changes so this is one of the problem with custom boards too because uh, even uh, if you buy a uh, device a com desktop computer or a server uh, from a manufacturer with a known um, standard board they might have custom stands <laughs> so basically locking you into their ecosystem or their you know um, their company so keep that in mind so that's another thing I should mention actually so let's say you have a ATX motherboard on a uh, server or a desktop computer that doesn't necessarily mean you can actually replace that entire ATX motherboard with a standard ATX motherboard motherboard size may be standard ATX they might have changed the mounting hole positions for that ATX motherboard uh, to some weird configurations I have seen people do that specifically Dell not so much HP and other guys but yeah Dell does that a lot so keep that in mind uh, you know that's one reason why um, a lot of people hate Dell uh, because they might change those configurations. so it's not just also a custom motherboard type or size that might um, have an issue uh, you know when you're trying to replace those motherboard but also where this uh, the the desktop uh, is support for that motherboard where the the mounting holes are uh, uh, you know is something that you need to take into consideration so when you're buying a laptop so desktop computer uh, or a server computer uh, server uh, you should uh, look into those uh, before you purchase it is bigger always better in 2022 the form factor has very little to do with capabilities of a motherboard so you could actually have a mini uh, uh, ITX doing similar task and same task as a micro ATX and most likely going to have very little difference between a ATX and a micro ATX because they can cram all those components into micro ATX the ATX form factor may give you like a little bit of more breathing room maybe so a standard ATX and a micro ATX may support the same or similar chipset processors RAM etc but it is not always the case however so to be more clear about the, uh, the answer to that question um, I would say it is complicated so if somebody asks you is be is bigger always better I would say not really it's it's uh, not always but the answer is a little bit more complicated the reason for being even though you may be able to get a micro ATX or an ATX board that can have the same capabilities sometimes the form factor do have an impact on what type of hardware will be supported on the motherboard for example the number of expansion slots may also varies depending on the form factor hence the capabilities and the hardware supported would be different so if you have extended ATX that may have a lot more expansion slots and uh, uh, you know um, uh, support uh, for different types of GPUs for example that may not be able to support on a let's say a mini ITX because there's not enough room right so if you look at um, at the bottom of your screen um, right here we have the extended ATX, ATX, micro ATX and mini ATX inside a case and this case can support all the way to extended ATX from starting from mini ITX but as I mentioned like I'm not I won't be able to install a high-end graphic card on a mini ITX because it won't first of all it won't fit because of the physical space and the mini ITX probably won't have that particular bus speeds and the configurations uh, to support that so while bigger is not always better because in 2022 the form factor has very little to do with it the form factor may 
uh, come into play when it's going you know when it's come to the point certain components because sometimes those form factors do have an impact on hardware so you need to take those into considerations enterprise and business servers their form factor is usually depending on depend on the manufacturer so the custom form factors from ibm dell and hp uh, cannot uh, be you know uh, interchanged with whatever the motherboard you want uh, and also uh, it also depend on the hardware support like for example uh, just because of um, it is a server board doesn't mean all the riser card uh, would uh, be able to uh, go slotted into those uh, pci slots or expansion slots on that server board for example if you have a rack mountable server the riser card has to be a low profile riser card like you can't get a regular riser card that goes on to a desktop uh, server and insert it into a rack mountable server because that riser card will be too tall right so the hardware support the riser card support uh, may also varies depending on the board and where the riser card support is going to go in uh, multi-processor support uh, not all boards as i mentioned support multi-processors and the server case itself so the desktop servers versus rack mountable servers as i mentioned and the blade servers which um, i will go into depth uh, in separate videos the different types of servers um you know those are completely different from each other in some cases like for example desktop servers are nowhere near in terms of form factor and configurability compared to a blade server actually the blade server has less configurability in a certain in a certain hardware aspect compared to a desktop server that's what i mean to say right because desktop server is like a desktop computer you have enough room to play around but a rack mountable server and a blade server won't have that kind of room uh, to play around uh, compared to a desktop server so those are the things that you need to consider when you are looking at enterprise and business server um, you know a motherboard uh, form factor so it is the bigger is not always better uh, but again uh, depending on the situation bigger may be better like you know uh, servers with uh, uh, multiple uh, cpus are typically bigger compared to servers with uh, uh, only one or two cpu so if you have four five cpu six cpu support uh they said the board may be li um, always going to be bigger than that of a, a server board that only have like a one cpu or a two cpus this could maybe fit into a desktop server case another example of uh, how uh, size may be have may have a factor uh, on uh, capabilities of your motherboard but again, I just want to emphasize this, bigger is not always better, but sometimes it can be better. So it, the answer can be a bit complicated and I have explained that right here. Bridge to somewhere. So system buses or chipsets is how data is transported to components. So keep that in mind. So system resources are limited on motherboards and some components need faster transmission speeds than others. And so the system engineers design motherboards with different speeds for different components. So the differentiation may become a thing in the past uh, as the time goes on. However, as of now, um, the different resources have different speeds and they can directly interact with each other each other so how we do this is to divide your uh, motherboard into two separate uh, sectors what i call a sector is basically the south bridge and the north bridge so you may have heard these terms before especially if you have interest in it so the north bridge is the faster uh, sector of your motherboard while the south bridge is considered as the slower sector of your motherboard the reason for that is the north bridge deals with things like pcie uh, cpu and ram that has an extremely high bus speed or the speed in which it communicate these component communicate compared to that of let's say a keyboard or a usb port or a, a you know key, a keyboard connected to a usb port right or a IDE or a legacy component or PCI things like that so I wouldn't say extremely fast but it is extremely fast but like especially the CPU is extremely fast compared to a 
USB. So um, what that means is basically if you put all of these items down here with all of these items up here in a one single sector, what's going to happen is the speed at which the calculations is happening at the CPU, RAM, and, and uh, for example, uh, going to be much faster than that of the uh, calculations happening down here with, uh, let's say, with a USB drive or a PCIe component. As a result, that this mismatch gonna create a problem. So this this might come in an input, and the input goes into the CPU. Even by the time the CPU, uh, sorry, and then the CPU spit out the output right away. But by the time that output comes back into the PCI slot, well, guess what? PCI slot is still sending out inputs because it's not done sending out input. There's it's slow. So that's gonna create a conflict, right? So how are we gonna mitigate this? is by creating the north bridge south bridge separation so the north bridge south bridge what it does is separating the faster components of your motherboard from the slower components of your motherboard and then creating a channel between the, the, the uh, those two sectors allowing it to properly communicate against each other so instead of having all of these components and all of these components connected to a one single sector now we have two sectors so the faster communicating with the faster sector called the node bridge and the uh, slower uh, sector uh, components are communicating with the slower uh, sector which is known as a south bridge and then these each of these sectors going to process that information and then share that uh, information between them so that the entire system would work so that's what you need to know about the north bridge and the south bridge and on a motherboard uh, in uh, even in 2022 you can typically see where the separation happens for example the south bridge would have a heat sink similar to like this and the north bridge have another heat sink uh, and then you would know this is the north bridge and this is south bridge and the south bridge is typically located as far uh, away from the uh, the cpu but closer to sometimes memory uh, ram uh, and um, these are the RAM slots, uh, uh, and the uh, the North Bridge is typically closer to the CPU. So the North Bridge typically goes as right next to the CPU as possible uh, because that will shorten the you know the traces that goes uh, between the uh, CPU and the North Bridge. That's why uh, traces are like basically electrical connections between uh, different components on the motherboard, which I will talk about uh, later. So keep that in mind. Not all the components on your motherboard can directly communicate against each other without uh, this type of a separation because they have different speeds. So that's why we have a bridge. So we have a south bridge and a north bridge. So it is a bridge to nowhere. It's a somewhere, not a bridge to nowhere, right? So it's a, just a play on words. It's a joke. Intel and AMD chipsets and processor sockets. So before we go into you know separate chipsets uh, manufacturers and how they uh, you know come up with these different types uh, such as intel and amd in this case uh, let's look at what is a chipset so a chipset is a set of chips therefore we call it chipset on motherboard that works closely with processor and control uh, the memory buses and uh, the some other uh, components on your motherboard so keep that in mind chipset is a set of chips in other words you know electronic silicon or chips um the work together therefore it's called the chipset on a motherboard that works closely with the processor to control memory buses on the motherboard and some other components chipset must be compatible with the processor so if you have a chipset that is specifically designed for Intel processors, you cannot use it with a AMD processor. There are other reasons why you can, for example, socket type. Uh, we'll go into that in detail in next few slides. So let's look at what is a socket, right? In that case, right? Because depending on your socket type, uh, the chipset is also different and the type of uh, processor supported is different. Socket is a rectangular or square section on your motherboard with either pins or pads that would allow a processor to be installed. So the definition of a socket is a rectangular 
or square section on the motherboard with either pins or pads that would allow the processor to be installed. Chipset manufacturers includes AMD, Intel, Asus, Nvidia, IBM, etc. However, even if Asus manufacture a chipset uh, that would actually uh, have an architecture of either AMD or Intel because those are the two major or the only known uh, well known uh, you know uh, processor manufacturers. So when AMD uh, make chipsets, they would make typically for themselves. Uh, they are, they are uh, uh, processors Intel would make for themselves as well. But when NVIDIA, ASUS and IBM, when they make chipsets, what they would do, they would look at the architecture for the AMD and Intel and based on that architecture, they make their own chipset. Like for example, ASUS AMD motherboard would have the AMD architecture and ASUS Intel motherboard would have the Intel architecture associated chipset. Processor manufacturers includes uh, Intel and AMD. Uh, so other uh, minor players do exist, but not significant e enough to cover in this course. And in fact, I don't think it is significant enough to cover in any course uh, because Intel and AMD are so big right now and they are pretty much the 95% of the market uh, as of now. Um, this is where you might have a question for me uh, asking why why do we even have other manufacturers other than Intel and AMD if we don't even hear them uh, about a lot? Well, if you go to certain countries such as China, uh, they may have their own, uh, uh, I heard they have their own processor manufacturers uh, for security reasons because of their paranoid about, you know, like maybe democratic countries taking over communist China, for example, I don't know. So what they're going to do is basically they will build their own um, uh, chipsets and uh, processors uh, that would run, uh, typically run on Unix uh, uh, or Unix-like, like Linux type environments. Uh, and uh, they would have their own processes associated with that. But we don't usually hear about them. Uh, I don't think any of you have heard about them uh, unless you spoke on to someone like me. So I would say covering Intel and AMD only would be more than enough. It is more than enough for your IT career. So let's look at Intel uh, micro architecture and processor families. So Intel used something called the LGA sockets. So these are known as the LAN grid array sockets or LGA sockets. And uh, the current Intel micro uh, architectures um, are listed uh, right here. I basically took it out from the Wikipedia page um, and it would li it has those list of different architectures. So if you look at it, uh, there are like you know Sandy Bridge, uh, Haswell, uh, Skylake, Sunny Cove, etc., etc. Those are like the terms used by the Intel uh, to describe the architectures, like a, a code name or the project name that they use, and those get filtered down to the consumers as well. So after the second generation of Intel core family of processors, we can now use the four digits of the model number to identify which generation of the Intel, uh, you know, uh, processor that the processor you are looking at. For example, if you have core i7-2600 processor, we know it is belong to the second generation of i7 because it start with 26, I start with two here. Uh, so that is a, an easy way to identify which generation of that core family uh, that chipset, uh, sorry, this um, uh, processor is belong to. So if somebody give you a core i7-2600, you would know it is the Intel i7 processor at the second generation level. So if you look at the Intel LGA LAN grid array socket, it looks like this. So on the motherboard, you will have pins sticking out. Uh, those are like uh, little pins uh, like sticking out with like kind of a, like a leaves uh, sticking out um, and then the back of the, your Intel um, CPU uh, the processor uh, would have these dots and this is what we call the LAN grid array or LGA type of uh, processor so the, the, the socket type right so these pads gonna get in contact with these pins on the motherboard when you put this CPU in here and then close this uh, mechanism and it'll just uh, make a good contact between those pads and the pins 
and hence that's how the cpu get connected to the motherboard so those are called lga keep that in mind that is they are associated with intel uh, cpus amd micro architecture and processor families are different that of the uh, intel uh, because now the socket type also changes the socket type is uh, now zif which is the lan grid array sockets and they looks on the motherboard like this so in this case the motherboard would have holes like the tiny holes where it can take in these pins on the um the cpu so the amd zif type will have the pin sticking out as opposed to if you look at the intel type it doesn't have the pins it have these pads and then the pins are on the motherboard you could say it right so all these connection points are on the motherboard you could consider as them like pins but they're not really pins they're like contact points they're flex a little bit flexible than a pin and then you have the pads on the uh, chip that's how the intel works but if you look at the zif amd type the pins are on the actual cpu and those pins get inserted into these um, sock uh, this so socket uh, holes and then when you uh, pull the, pull down this mechanism and lock it and it get uh, you know uh, seated into the motherboard so it is different so the current amd uh, micro architecture includes uh, these items uh, such as k8 k9 sen2 sen3 sen2 etc etc um, and uh, the product lineup includes the uh, Athlon, uh, Ryzen, Threadripper, Epic, etc, etc. So keep in mind, uh, typically AMD are uh, ZIF or ZIF uh, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the Intel uh, uh, one is the LGA. So keep that in mind. Those are differences between the Intel uh, LGA uh, and the AMD ZIF. So here's a question that asked by all the computer enthusiasts, uh, gamers and uh, home users and everybody else is the is LGA or is it IF? Which is better? So at this point in 2022, it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't really matter whether you go with the LGA type CPU or ZIF CPU. What really matters is what processor you need. If you want an Intel processor, you're going to end up with the LGA most likely. Um, and then um, if you want an AMD processor, you're going to end up with the ZIF most likely. And whatever the processor you, uh, that fits your need, that's what you should go with. However, LGA can support a higher density of connections because we can add more connection points closer together as opposed to pins in the ZIF. So if you look at the LGA, how it is manufactured, um, it has those, uh, you know, connection points, right? Instead of pins, it has connection points. So you can put a lot of those points really close to each other without touching each other or, uh, you know, creating a, uh, you know, short circuit, right? But with pins, you need more room because the pin is actually sticking out and it needs more room so therefore it needs to be a little bit um, uh, you know parsley you know like basically spread up press spread out so lga socket will be more preferable in the future because the number of connection points will grow as the time goes on so i think most likely uh, even um, uh, amd may switch uh, onto the uh, uh, intel type uh, lga socket type uh, one thing I have heard uh, in the public uh, that a lot of people have <laughs> saying is that AMD processors, if you damage one of these pins, not damage, like bend one of these pins, you may be able to bend it back and that would be just fine that you can still use it. With Intel, uh, because these um, you know connection uh, points right here, these, these things are on the motherboard. If you bend one of these, you can bend this. It is pretty safe the processor itself but if you bend one of these on the motherboard uh yeah it will it will be next to impossible to uh, fix it um yeah like um maybe like if you if you are an armature maybe you will damage uh, these pins but i would say it's highly unlikely you're going to damage it because once you install this you probably never going to take it out even if you replace the thermal paste you don't need to take out the um 
the uh, CPU at all. So I don't think that's a big deal. But one of the concerns that some people have uh, right now is that if you damage one of these pins, you have to replace the entire motherboard because there are no pins here. You can damage the CPU. But in here, if you damage the uh, pins on the AMD, uh, you can simply replace uh, um, uh, the C CPU itself or even bend the uh, pin back up. But I don't think that's a big deal. It's, I mean, I wouldn't worry about it. As a te computer technician, as an IT professional, you shouldn't have any problem with bend pins or bend connections. You should not. You should be able to install these CPUs at ease. Intel and AMD socket types. So uh, the must. Uh, so remember, I mentioned this before. You must match the processor to the socket and the motherboard. So both Intel and AMD has different socket types, so you can interchange them. Uh, but but at the same time, the socket types itself within that same manufacturer differ. For example, Intel LGA one one five one. Or 1151 and LGA 1155 are two different socket types. You can have a CPU Intel LGA 1155 being inserted into LGA 1366. That's not going to work. So even if you buy an Intel motherboard uh, and an Intel socket type, you know you need to make sure that not only that socket uh, that so that particular socket type of the motherboard uh, compatible with your Intel particular. A socket type of your CPU you purchase so you can have an Intel motherboard but may not support or uh, you know let's say uh, the Intel um, uh, CPU that you purchase same apply for the AMD AMD have AM4 AM3 plus FM2 plus etc you can have a AMD uh, AM4 motherboard uh, uh, taking an FM2 plus uh, uh, you know CPU socket type so keep that in mind so it's not just uh, in the previous slide we look at like the different um, you know different uh, architectures that use for the socket itself but also there are types within those architectures that you need to take into consideration so you know you can just you know say hey you know is, is it, it is LGA so all LGA should fit there no it doesn't so keep that in mind so in, there are different types of LGA so keep th that in mind when you are trying to uh, build your uh, PC so how would you do the matching? So because there are different types in addition to the manufacturers, uh, different configurations, how would you actually, you know, get this thing matched? So uh, what I would do is look at the motherboard manufacturer's website or use a guide for list of processes that, but that particular motherboard support. You can also search the Intel or AMD website for exact processor to make sure the socket it uses is the same as the socket on the motherboard. So you have to use these resources to make sure that those match. If not, you might have to do an exchange or a, a, you know change your motherboard. So desktop CPU sockets. Um, uh, here's a summary of. Uh, the uh, the uh, some of the uh, desktop CPU uh, sockets that I already have briefly mentioned before, but in this table it's the uh, we have nicely put together um, the uh, you know the different socket type uh, and the associated uh, CPU. Uh, and keep in mind these are the current sockets you see in the market by the Intel and AMD. And please, please remember again, this is very important. Motherboards have a specific CPU socket in which only certain processors will fit and you need to make sure you match those. So if you look at the socket types, for example, if I want a socket type LGA 2011, uh, that would have uh, Intel i7 and Xeon uh, processors or Xenon processors. Uh, and then LGA 1155 would support Intel uh, i7, i5, and i3s, uh, and so on. So you can exchange between them. And if you go to AMD ones, FM2 Plus uh, would support these, uh, as opposed to let's say FM1 that would support uh, you know AMD Athlon 2, for example. So you can you know uh, exchange between them, as I mentioned before. So this is a key important thing. That's why I'm repeating them. As an IT technician, you should know it's not just the A LGA versus EZIF. It is also within the LGA, there are different times. Within the EZIF, there are different um, socket configurations. So keep that in mind. So let's look at the bus. 
So it is not that kind of a bus. So we are not talking about a bus where you, the school children will go in or a bus uh, where you take to work. But this is a different type of bus that we're going to talk about, which is you found on your motherboards. So what is a bus or buses on a motherboard compared to a bus like this? So the bus is basically a system of pathways used for communication and the protocol and methods used for transmission. So the bus includes the system of pathways used for communication as well as the protocols in which um, the, and the methodologies which it is using to communicate um, with each other or different components. So the motherboard bus is a set of wires that allow one part of the motherboard to connect and communicate with other parts of the motherboard, including the central processing unit. So the very definition of a motherboard is the right here. It is a set of wires that allows one part of the motherboard to connect and communicate with another part or parts of the motherboard, including the central processing unit. Traces, those are fine lines you see on the motherboard and they are electrical pathways. So if you look at right the, the, all of these things, these are traces and these are actually electrical connections or electrical pathways uh, going to towards this uh, CPU and then uh, going towards uh, to something else. Let's say maybe this is a RAM, right? So this RAM is being connected to CPU through these uh, buses and but this, these buses use these traces to, uh, you know, uh, to communicate between uh, those different components. A protocol, which is mentioned up here because bus is a pathway and a protocol, so the combination. So the protocol is a set of rules and standards that any two entities use to, for communication. So you heard this term before when I had uh, my previous lectures on network engineering. I mentioned pro how important network protocols are. B protocols are basically a agreed upon rules which the communication would occur between different components or devices and etc etc so like for example if this component is speaking in english this component is speaking in french that's not going to work right so imagine that way like they need to have a common language so a protocol is an established common language but instead of English and French, it's going to be like a specific set of instructions that these computer components are going to follow in order for communication to happen between different components. So the bus, a motherboard bus or motherboard buses is a system of pathways to use for that communication using those protocols. And they are basically a set of wires that allows one part of the motherboard to connect to the other parts. So that's what makes the motherboard buses different from your school buses, right? <laughs> so it's, it's another joke. Well, yeah, my jokes are pretty bad actually. So let's look at bus bandwidth. Uh, so the older PCI standards include PCIe X, use a parallel bus so where uh, data is sent with multiple ones and O's simultaneously. However, PCIe is a serial bus and the data is sent one bit at a time, How, but it is much faster. So if you look at the right hand side, we have a table of uh, different bus types and the maximum bandwidth. Uh, what you need to remember here is as you go from PCI all the way to PCIe X32, the maximum bandwidth uh, have significantly increased. Uh, so this is why we have different version of PCI uh, because we are now changing those bus speeds and those agree upon standards in terms of communication so that we get a better performance out of your uh, devices. Expansion slots. So expansion slots allow new or additional functionality to be added to a motherboard. Systems like laptops have very limited expansion slot capacity due to si their size. In fact, most uh, very compact uh, laptops do not even have expansion uh, uh, slots at all. Um, I hardly seen modern laptops with expansion slots, but laptops uh, that uh, I have purchased in 2000, early 2000 and uh, mid 2000s, I seen, uh, you know, sometimes comes with some expansion slots. Uh, so what are the types of expansion slots exist? So as I mentioned, PCI 
E1X would look like this. PCIe16X uh, looks like this. PCIe4X uh, uh, looks like this. PCIe8X looks like this. And regular PCIs, which are much lower speeds, uh, look like these. So this is what they typically look like. And, uh, you know, there are uh, differences in 1x, 4x, and 8x. And if you want to know uh, what's the differences between those uh, 1x, 4x, and 8x, uh, you can go to my previous slides right here. And it actually explained that in this nice table exactly what it means to have these different types. But if you're looking at a motherboard physically, like you're just visually examining your motherboard, this is what you would uh, see. And uh, uh, it's pretty easy to uh, separate the PCIe 1X from the PCIe uh, 16X because of the way the sheer size and how the, the these configurations work. Like for example, PCIe 16X would even have a bracket uh, a locking mechanism uh, at the end of that um, uh, slot right here. So you need to actually push it down to take it out. And when you press it down, it'll lock itself. And you don't see that in uh, typically on PCI uh, X, 1X items. See, it doesn't have that locking mechanism. Same with the PCI, they don't have the locking mechanisms, right? So that's another way of uh, figuring out where is your PCIe 16X uh, expansion slot. So this is just giving you the overall big picture. Internal ports and connectors. So internal uh, connectors on your motherboards could be USBs, uh, M.2, SATA, IDE, PCIe, etc., etc. Those are all can be, uh, you know, internal connectors comes with your motherboard, depending on your motherboard. So SATA, which stands for Serial Advanced Technology Attachment or Serial ATA or ATA, uh, those are a type of connectors uh, that uh, would look like these uh, which is shown on the top right hand right here those are like uh, those are the SATA connectors and these are actually SATA cables and this right here is a SATA connector on a, uh, I believe this is a SSD uh, so uh, they are an interface standard uh, used uh, mostly by storage devices uh, so uh, this is uh, typically used for storage um, so you SSD is uh, even regular uh, spinning uh, hard drives and current versions of the SATA include the SATA Express, which is known as SATA E, SATA 3, SATA 2, etc., etc. So those are like different versions of the SATA that have different speeds uh, associated with it. M.2, uh, which is a newer version, I would say, uh, compared to SATA, uh, formerly known as the next generation form factor, also known as NGFF, and uses the PCIe, a USB or SATA interface to connect a mini add-on card sometimes uh, that allowing you to create that M.2 space for older motherboards and commonly used by wireless uh, cards uh, and uh, solid state drives like SSDs. So here's a little bit more on M.2. Uh, an M.2 slot is a keyed uh, with a notch to hold an M.2 card with a B key or M key uh, edge connector. Uh, so if you want to know what they are, what they look like, it's uh, here's a diagram showing some, you know, this is what the B key end connector look like. And this is a M key uh, end connector look like, and this is a uh, B and M key edge connector. So like. they basically, they have a cutout on the connection points right here. Uh, and the different places and different configuration that is causing it to B key, M key and the B and M key, right? So B key uses a gap in the right side of the card. So the B key on the right side of the card, left side of the uh, of the uh, most uh, host controller with six pins to the right of the gap. So there are six pins right here. And this configuration support PCIe um, 2X uh, bus connections. And the M key uses the gap on the left side of the card, so on the other side of the card. But this time, to make it uh, easier to uh, differentiate also, we only have five pins in the in this gap right here. After the gap, we have five pins. And this configuration support PCIe 4X uh, bus connections for twice the data throughput uh, and just using five pins. So the B, B key will have six pins on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, M key have, have five pins on the uh, left-hand side. 
B plus M key, uh, that uses both of the above gaps. So you have two gaps, as I mentioned, and with the five pins on the left side of the uh, card and the six pins on the right side of the card. So six here and the five here. And because of the physical design, B and M key cards are limited to PCIe 2X speeds. So keep those in mind. And those are the differences. And here is an example of someone inserting a um, M.2 uh, drive. Uh, I believe this is a hard drive, uh, SSD, solid state drive, uh, into a motherboard. So they are just inserting here, right here. And you can see that notch right here that's showing the one of those notches. So this looks like uh, this could be a B key type. Uh, so they are just basically inserting there by just pushing in there, right? Adding M.2 support. So you cannot add M.2 support to laptops, uh, most uh, mini PCs and all-in-one compact devices. And why would be that the case? Because most laptops and mini PCs and all-in-one devices do not have uh, PCIe or PCI uh, um, support, right? Uh, if you are going to add an M.2 um, uh, fast speed, uh, um, you know, um, uh, component, um, I recommend that you have at least PCIe because the reason for that is what's the point of buying a, a, a M.2 uh, SSD uh, with higher speed write cycles and speeds, uh, sorry, higher speed write, uh, you know, um, uh, speeds and then use a, a bottleneck uh, on the card that you're trying to uh, create this uh, PCIe, right? Sorry, M.2 slot, right? So. I would always make sure that it is a PCIe slot uh, that we're gonna be inserting those expansion slot. Uh, so expansion of this uh, M.2 support, right? Keep that in mind. So if the motherboard cannot boot, uh, there's another thing that you need to keep into consideration. If the motherboard cannot boot from the PCIe, um, even if you add uh, that expansion uh, support, uh, you know, you add that card to support the M.2, uh, it won't be able to uh, set the M.2 drive as the boot drive. So which means you won't benefit from a lot of the speeds that you wanna get. So keep that in mind too. So a couple of things, again, I'm gonna repeat that because it sounds pretty convoluted <laughs> the way I said it. So I'm gonna repeat that again. When it's come to the point adding M.2 support to your motherboard, if your motherboard does not already come with built-in M.2 support, Always recommend using at least PCIe 4X bus speed and higher or PCIe, minimum PCIe, some type of PCIe, uh, you know, um, card that or higher. In this case, like you see right here, a PCIe card is a different type again. This is a PCIe uh, 16, I believe, 16X. So make sure you use a card like that. And if you want to get the maximum benefit out of that, that M.2 drive, which higher speed and faster uh, access, read write access, you need to make sure that your motherboard can support uh, booting from a device uh, um, hook up onto the PCIe slot. Not all motherboards can do that. So keep that in mind when you do that. Another reason why you may want to uh, add a M.2 support uh, via a PCIe card is to support RAID configuration or increase your hard drive capacity. So if you're not using it for booting purposes, like to install your operating system, uh, you, you can also uh, uh, use uh, this um, type of expansion uh, slots, uh, the, in this case PCIe slot, with an expansion card that support multiple M.2 drives. Hence, you can create a RAID configuration here, or you can create increase your storage space. So typically these cards can do both. Uh, they typically come with either hardware RAID or software RAID, which you can add it onto your uh, server or to your um, desktop drive. So that's another reason why you may need to add a card to support your M.2 uh, drives. So two options. If you don't have M.2 support, you can use a card like this. If you do have, uh, sorry, if you don't have M.2 support, but if you want to also increase 
the capabilities of your device such as RAID and uh, you know additional M.2 drives, you can use a card like this. These are typically more expensive compared to these. These are very, very cheap. You can get one of these uh, for maybe less than 50 bucks. These can cost up to $1,000 depending on the card. PCIe and PCIe expansion slots. So here's a, I mentioned PCIe and PCIe expansion slot in the previous couple of slides, but here is a, a overall uh, high level overview of the differences. So PCIe uh, is a newer version of PCI. So the PCI uh, is the conventional PCI slots and uh, buses are slower uh, because they are the older version of the PCIe. The PCI came first uh, before PCI uh, Express, uh, you know, as a next iteration. So the slots are slightly taller than the PCIe slots. They are the PCIe slots are much taller. So if you look at the the configuration of your motherboard, the PCI slots are a little bit taller. In the plastic piece that coming out of of the motherboard is higher, taller. Uh, when you look at against the PCIe. Uh, transmit 32 data bits or data bits in parallel and operates about 500 megabyte per second and used for all types of add-on cards um, in the past uh, even even today sometime PCIe which is a newer newer version newer iteration of PCI uh, which is currently comes in four different slot sizes uh, they are called PCI Express 1x 4x 8x and 16x and the X uh, comes after uh, the, uh, the the comes after the uh, the you know PCI uh, Express uh, term refers to the number of lanes available for data. So the 16x uh, the card uh, I will go you backward. This is actually a 16x card right here. This is a 16x. So that has way more uh, connections than this one. And uh, this probably. Uh, probably 8x card and um, you know x refers to that that those number of lanes available right so example pcie 4x uh, contains four lanes and pcie 16x contains 16 lanes the pcie x16 slot is often used by graphic cards that require large uh, throughput in fact almost every single graphic card right now in the market uh, use uh, pcie uh, x16 to provide extra wattage required for those type of cards that require large uh, throughput, uh, the card may have one or two or three uh, connectors to connect the card to extra power uh, connectors. So basically your uh, graphic cards, which I'm not gonna cover today in this lecture, it's a separate lecture, uh, you will have extra uh, power supply connectors to power that card. So if you have a, 16x PCI uh, e Express network card, you probably don't need an, a power supply separate connection to that card. It will take the power through the PCIe 16x slot itself. But when it comes to point graphic cards and other high uh, voltage uh, uh, cards, you can't take all the power from the PCIe uh, bus. So you have to uh, complement that with additional power connectors which we will discuss later when we will go over the graphic cards unit but keep that in mind when you are looking at those uh, PCIe um, um, cards and options so here's a more on PCIe versions uh, so if you look at the PCIe version uh, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. You can see as the version number increase, we have increased the giga transfers per second. We went from 2.5 giga transfers per second all the way to 32 uh, giga transfers per second. What those giga transfers translate into is shown here. So 32 giga uh, transfers per second is roughly about four gigabyte per second as opposed to 2.5 giga transfers per second is about 250 uh, megabyte per second. Uh, and on this diagram um, on the right hand side, uh, I have shown here, uh, which is taken out from the A plus certification textbook, uh, showing how PCI adapter installation is different uh, depending on, on the type of slot and the card that you're using. Like right here for 1X, uh, we only have available that. 
and then the 2x it could be this or this either one would be available and if we go all the way to 16x 16x can come in any of these options uh, available uh, on your card so keep that in mind so you could have a 16x card look like that and a 16x card x card look like that as well because it is possible 16 X can support all of these type uh, as shown here and on the bottom of your screen you can see how 1x link versus 7x links how they are differ and this is just an overall big picture uh, you just need to know you know they are different and how they uh, you know how they compare to each other riser cards so a low profile or a slimline case may not give you enough room to install an expansion card standing up uh, in its slot so if you look at especially server boards and especially the blade servers uh, or the servers that has uh, rack mountable servers like 2u 3u rack mountable servers those rack mountable servers uh, is pretty much that would be the depth of it that would be the height of it i mean so you can't actually put a large card right here or right on here because it's going to go you know more than uh, what it can handle in physical space so you can't put it uh, you know 90 degrees to the motherboard by just sticking in there because the card is too high so in that situation we can use those riser cards so a riser card installs in the slot that we are, we are typically would install directly where the the component uh, and provides another slot at a right angle and extend number of slots as well so in this riser card they not only actually put allow us to install now a card at a right angle but it also allow us uh, to increase the number of slots available uh, for the expansion so it went from one expansion slot to having one two three expansion slots at 90 degrees to that exp uh, the original expansion slot right so the writer card comes uh, for all types of pci as well as pcie slots and oftentimes used in rack mountable servers as i mentioned uh, due to limited physical space and those servers uh, the, those cards sometimes comes in a configuration like this as well so in this card is like a standalone card just stick it in there and it'll give you those 90 degree three um three uh, expansion slots but in here uh, it will have this entire casing so these are typically found in hp enterprise servers this is actually from an hp enterprise server i believe and you basically plug it in and it gets secured into the case itself and uh, one more thing that is not mentioned on this slide that is very important is that not only your motherboard has to support um, you know this type of configurations um, but what really important is your uh, your case needs to support it so if you put a riser card right here and the case doesn't have this slot to secure your cards yeah that's a bad idea so your case should support it as well so like I mentioned, the enterprise servers such as HP enterprise servers have these riser card mm -hmm. modules. So it's not just a card, the entire module with these uh, metal uh, aluminum pieces where it directly fits onto your uh, HP servers. Again, these are very commonly used in, um, in rack mountable servers because of the limited space associated with those rack mountable servers, right? So keep that in mind. IDE and internal USB. IDE stands for Integrated Drive Electronics and they use uh, to interface uh, storage devices with uh, motherboards and IDE connectors has 40 pins. IDE connectors are actually an older legacy uh, connectors but you still may come across it uh, as you work in the IT field uh, because there are a lot of older devices out there still use IDE. USB which is a universal serial bus uh, in that is a different type of uh, internal uh, connector. Uh, those are um, include the USB headers that is used to connect the cable from a motherboard to a USB ports of on the front of the computer case 
and some motherboards may also have additional USB connectors that may include the USB 2.0, 3.0, generation 1, generation 2, etc, uh, etc et as of 2022. So for example on here this is a uh, IDE uh, integrated drive electronics uh, connector right here and like I mentioned this is an older type connector it's a legacy connector most new motherboards don't come with it the USB serial bus connectors look like this with the pins uh, and then the other end of this uh, would have a uh, connector where you typically associated with which are the the USB connector ports right and the USB 3.0 connectors and three like the 3.2 3.2 uh, generation uh, 2 connectors they may look like this uh, but they may also look different like they may actually look uh, like a typical USB connector because um, uh, so that you can differentiate between the 2.0 connectors and those right so keep that in mind so the modern uh, uh, laptops uh, sorry modern desktop computer motherboards as well as server boards will have uh, 2.0 as well as the 3.0 usb connectors and this is a legacy device legacy connector i don't typically see them anymore but you might come across them external ports and connectors Motherboards have ports and connectors for external components. They include the keyboard, the mouse, the USB devices, network interface connections, the network interface card, right? Sound connections, etc. etc. And some motherboards may require iOS Shield to be installed uh, along with the motherboard, and some motherboard comes with integrated I. Uh, uh, IO or the input output uh, shield. So if you look at the right hand side, uh, sorry, left hand side, this is a type of an integrated input output shield. So it is integrated onto the motherboard and there is no metal piece or anything that you need to insert. But in this type of motherboard, you have a metal piece that you need to make sure that you install onto your case before you stick it in your motherboard. Otherwise, you have to take the motherboard out, all the components and everything out and put that metal piece there. And that metal piece will cover these uh, empty spaces, the, these blank spaces in between these uh, components uh, for dust proof and air proof, um, proof in the backside of your device so and make it nicer for you right so again um, motherboard uh, ports uh, allow us uh, to connect external components such as keyboards and mouse so one thing i want to point out here is that the modern motherboards uh, may uh, come with a uh, video uh, output like a video uh, connections like this like hdmi but some modern motherboards do not have a video output and why would that be the case well there are uh, cpus that you can buy from intel and amd that do not have integrated graphic support you have to have you must have a graphic card in that case even if your motherboard has a uh, uh, a, a connection to a, a video device, a display device such as HDMI, uh, DVI, uh, D sub port, or etc. etc. You won't be able to get a video signal out because you need to have a separate graphic card. There are some uh, CPUs like that, so keep that in mind when you are picking out and selecting your devices. But typically, uh, most of them will have onboard. Uh, um, video support and they would have HDMI or a DSAB or etc etc connection even VGA sometimes uh, especially with server motherboards even in 2022 you will uh, get a, a VGA uh, connections uh, as opposed to HDMI and DVI connections so the, the server motherboards will almost always always will have the video support built into the motherboard and the chipset and the cpu so you will be able to just plug it in a, a video uh, device like a monitor and the servers would be able to display that information but with the desktop keep in mind that this uh, may be disabled if you don't have the right uh, cpu so again i'm going to repeat that for servers you will have built in 
uh, video support right out of the box in every single case and you will have typically VGA or HDMI or a, uh, a DVI connection in the back and typically VGAs on most uh, servers. But for desktops, these connectors, these video connectors may not be active depending on your CPU and the chipset because not uh, all CPUs and chipset would have the built-in uh, graphic support. And typically the motherboard will have a couple of uh, USB uh, connections. Uh, you will you will or will not, you may or may not have a PS2 connectors because again, nowadays the PS2 connectors are being paced out uh, and uh, in favor of USB. So you can plug a USB keyboard or a USB mouse and it'll just work. You don't need the PS2s. Uh, you will have sometimes uh, eSATA connectors. Again, that is being paced out slowly as the USB 3.0 coming out. Uh, sometimes you will get both 2.0 and 3.0 USB, USB connectors. You might have uh, one uh, um, network interface card if it is a desktop, such as this one right here or this one right here, or multiple uh, network interface uh, output, uh, you know, NIC, uh, you know, LAN connections if it is a server. And uh, finally, you will have um, some audio output as shown here. Again, the servers will not have those audio outputs that you will see on a, a desktop device. So desktop devices will have these kind of HD audio connectors that you would not find on a server. So servers typically don't have this part because there's no need for server to have audio, right? So that's why. So here is a overall big picture uh, of a desktop uh, motherboard and uh, you can see uh, this one, this particular motherboards have built in RAID. That's why I say SATA RAID right here. So these I have one, two, three, four. There's four connections. You can plug in four uh, hard drives in a, and you can cons configure RAID. Um, bit of a note of caution here. This RAID could be software RAID or this RAID could be hardware RAID. Hardware RAID is better than software RAID. I'm not gonna talk about RAID in this lecture because it's a separate lecture. I will discuss the different types of RAID and what is the differences and advantages and disadvantages of hardware RAID and software RAID. But keep that in mind when somebody say their motherboard or their, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the motherboard uh, manufacturer documentation is saying that it's, it support RAID. Um, keep in mind that it could be software RAID, it could be hardware RAID, right? so keep that in mind. So this is, this is a note of caution. And it shows uh, here different components. It clearly shows the north bridge closer to the CPU socket and the south bridge a little bit away from the CPU socket, but closer to the RAM and other components. And this is the south bridge right here so that the north bridge is closer to CPU. And here's a CPU socket right here. And uh, there are some other connections uh, points uh, shown here as well. This is the back side of it. Uh, where the input output components come in. Um, and uh, you can see all the other components listed here, uh, including the PCI Express uh, and PCI sl expansion slots uh, available up here, um, and the USB headers and all the other items that we have discussed and more in this slide. So if you wanna take a little bit of time looking at this, you can pause this video uh, on this slide, uh, slide number 26, and you can uh, watch, uh, you know, take a moment to look at all the options you have here. But keep in mind, every manufacturer has components in slightly different places and every motherboard for even from the same manufacturer, uh, depending on the motherboard version and the motherboard type may have, dif always have different, like you typically have different um, component arrangement. So don't memorize this, but just know uh, how to identify these different items. Here's a server board uh, that uh, in the overall big picture of a server board. In this case, this is a super micro server board, I believe, uh, with two um, uh, CPU support. Uh, so one of the key things that you should know uh, in a server board is that these um, RAM banks or memory banks are associated with uh, the nearby uh, CPU. For example, the memory that you are inserting here will work with this CPU only, and the memory that is inserting your here will work with this CPU only. 
So again, depending on your server board and who's manufacturing your server board and the type and the version of your model number of your server board, how these are configured and arranged may slightly differ. But when you have multiple CPUs, each CPU has to have its own separate memory banks uh, associated with it. So this will have their, its own ECC RAM memory installed here for this uh, uh, CPU and this will have its own CPU ECC memory installed right here. Uh, and just like a desktop board, uh, it will have some expansion slots up here, right here. These are expansion slots. These are PCIe slots right here. Um, and um, you will also see that, um, you know, different um, uh, uh, because the separation of the um, uh, north bridge and the south bridge like I believe this is actually the south bridge and uh, these are the north bridge uh, right here I believe um, so it, it's all you know it's all very similar to that of a desktop but again at the same time they are different one more thing I want to note, uh, note, note to you here is that even though it has two memory and everything they only have two uh, connectors uh, for uh, hard drives, why would be why, why would be that the case? Why would you have a server with so much power, with two CPUs and a lot of uh, RAM support, right? But only two connectors for like eSATA connectors for uh, hard drives. The reason for being, as I mentioned before, most of these server boards are used with a RAID card, and the RAID card would have multiple hard drive support uh, associated with it. So the RAID card can go in these uh, slots or sometimes RAID cards get connected using specialized connectors uh, associated with HP uh, or a Dell or whatever. So it will have a RAID card with whole bunch of hard drives going in, maybe let's say 20 hard drives gonna connect into that RAID card. Those 20 hard drives, those RAID cards behind those uh, hard drives gonna get connected with a special cable special bus it may not be even pcie so that's why you don't see many um, you know so remember the, the, this desktop board had a lot of uh, sata connections but this server board with more power doesn't have a lot of sata connections it only have two sata connections that is why because it will be supported through a rate card so keep that in mind uh, and this is just a big overall picture of it again you can see this is a vga connector as opposed to HDMI or any high-end uh, uh, graphical support. It just have basic VGA support in this uh, server board because servers doesn't need that kind of graphical support. Servers are not used to play games or watch videos or movies or anything like that, right? Servers are high-powered uh, business or enterprise-grade um, you know, systems. So they, they just have a VGA output built into it and uh they they have uh, you know uh, the 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 may have multiple uh, network interface cards built into it then you can also expand those network interface cards uh, with additional pcie express and uh, network interface expansion cards as well so keep that in mind the server is a powerhouse uh, for enterprise environment or business environment as opposed to a desktop is for uh, for you to use for your uh, either personal computing needs uh, such as work etc or your leisure such as watching videos and you know playing games etc etc so we're gonna switch gear a little bit now we're gonna look at uh, BIOS and UEFI so the firmware on the motherboard is used to enable or disable connector port or component control the frequency and the features of the CPU manage security features, control what happens when the computer first boots and monitor and log various activities of the board. So those are the key features or the key jobs for the firmware on the motherboard. Motherboard made after 2012 used BIOS UEFI firmware. Prior to uh, the 2012 motherboards just used the uh, BIOS uh, firmware. So uh, sometimes people use the term BIOS slash UEFI. Um, oftentimes you also hear the term just UEFI. UEFI is a newer version of a BIOS. You can actually look at UEFI as a newer version of a BIOS. So any motherboard 
that is typically manufactured after 2012 would have a UEFI, including server motherboards. Even server motherboards nowadays comes with complete UEFI firmware, not um, BIOS. So what is UEFI? So UEFI stands for Unified Extendable Firmware Interface uh, that improves uh, on the BIOS but includes um, BIOS um, for backward compatibility with older devices. So UEFI improves on the concept of BIOS but includes uh, backward compatibility for older devices. In case you have never heard the term BIOS before, the BIOS stand for basic input slash output system. So basic input slash output system. And as I mentioned, the primary function of a BIOS is acting like a, it, it's a firmware that enable uh, these uh, features on your motherboard. So it's basically the BIOS or UEFI is the first thing to get started when you press your power button. So if your computer or server is shut off and when you turn that back on, the power on, the first thing to kick in is the BIOS. BIOS is the one doing all the work before operating system and everybody else come into uh, play, right? Come, in, come online. So why use UEFI over BIOS? So Microsoft requires UEFI in order for a system to be certified for Windows 11, Windows 10, and Windows 8. UEFI is required for hard drives larger than two terabytes. So you cannot have a hard drive larger than two terabyte on a BIOS based uh, firmware. So if you have uh, BIOS firmware on your um, hard, uh, on your motherboard, the maximum you can go is just below two terabyte, um, you, know, you know, exactly have two terabyte. More than that, you can uh, support it. UEFI offers secure boot, uh, which prevents a system from booting up with drivers uh, for an uh, OD that is not in uh, digitally signed and trusted by the motherboard or computer manufacturer. So it, it's, it, it allow us to implement a additional security feature uh, for your drives uh, and the components. For backward compatibility, UEFI can boot uh, from MBR hard drive and uh, provides a BIOS boot uh, through its compatibility support module, also known as CSM feature. So if your hard drive is configured as MBR, which is a, uh, you know, the method of um, configuring your hard drive, like a formatting your hard drive, uh, then in that case, um, you know, UEFI can support the so MBRs uh, through the backward compatibility. Uh, I will discuss what are MBR and, uh, you know, uh, all of those items in a separate uh, lecture. So I'm not going to go into detail on that. Just know that UEFI can support uh, certain features uh, on BIOS uh, as a backward compatibility. And on the right hand side, this is just an image showing, you know, what a uh, UEFI look like compared to a BIOS. BIOS screens are typically basic screens uh, with the blues or black screens with some text on it where you can move up and down. As opposed to BIOS will have some graphical, uh, nice graphical GUI, uh, graphical user interface. CMOS. Uh, so now we have just Basic, got a basic overview of what a BIOS and UEFI uh, is about. Let's look at what a CMOS is. So CMOS is stand for complementary metal oxide uh, semiconductor and is the battery backup function for BIOS and UEFI that helps retain these settings and system time in the event of a power loss. So if you shut down your computer and you unplug your computer, the CMOS battery will keep going. Uh, the uh, to keep that uh, you know data retained within the settings and CMOS battery also makes sure that the time is kept on a device as long as the CMOS battery is uh, good to go so for example if you have a device that is unplugged for more than like maybe say 10 years when you boot up the computer it will say 9999 sometimes that means 9999 or year 1999 or something like that. So like that because of the CMOS battery has died and the clock has stopped, right? So the CMOS battery uh, is important to keep uh, the BIOS UEFI uh, uh, information as well as the system uh, time. 
CMOS RAM is a small amount of memory stored on the motherboard that retain data even when the computer is powered off. It is charged by a nearby lithium um, a coin cell battery. So the CMOS battery looks like that. It's a coin cell battery. And if you want to replace the CMOS battery, uh, what you need to do is uh, choose the correct replacement battery. So it must be the exact same match to the original or manufacturer recommended uh, specific specified battery. Uh, you need to make sure you power down the system, unplug it, press the power button uh, for a few seconds after you unplug it to drain any excess remaining power, uh, remove uh, the case cover, and please make sure the anti-static strap or also known as ESD strap uh, so that uh, you don't uh, you know, do a static discharge onto your motherboard causing a frying of some component and remove the old battery using flat headed screwdriver or pop the new battery and then you can pop the new battery into place. We have a caution here. I don't actually use the flat headed screwdriver because screwdriver is metal. I use a plastic prying tool. So if you have any uh, kit, as an IT technician, you should buy a kit uh, that has like all the different types of screw bits and the prying tools. And those plastic prying tools are much better uh, for you know uh, popping up this battery. So this particular note I put like a flat headed screwdriver, but prying tool is much better. A plastic prying tool won't damage, won't short circuit anything if you use it correctly. So I would recommend a plastic prime tool over a screwdriver for popping up that battery. And if you don't know how to uh, locate this battery or to even to pop out, because if it has a special mechanism, please read your uh, motherboard manual and that motherboard manual will give you uh, information on that. How do I access BIOS and UEFI? So now we're gonna switch back onto the UEFI and BIOS uh, that I explained before. Uh, so to access the BIOS uh, UEFI setup program, uh, you, you need to press a special uh, key on your motherboard. Those keys are uh, typically F2, L, F2 or delete uh, at the boot level. So depending on your motherboard manufacturer, uh, the key may be differ. So some key times it is F12, sometimes it's F2, sometimes delete. So I had a really hard time figuring out which one to press on a Dell uh, uh, office computer, a Dell um, business computer, because the boot screen flashed really fast and I have no idea what to press and it turns out it is F9. So, you know, it, it changes all the time, sometimes depending on uh, motherboard manufacturer. So keep that in mind. But most common types are F2, L, F2 and delete, but sometimes F9 and others too. Just look at uh, your splash screen when you boot up or find the manual. Either or, the manual will tell you as well. So see the documentation of your motherboard to, or watch the screen at the near uh, the beginning of the boot screen, right? So. Setup screen appears with menus with help features once you get into the BIOS uh, uh, screen. So that's these are the BIOS screens looks like. So this is a BIOS uh, with no UEFI. This is what the BIOS screen. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's just text uh, with uh, uh, keyboard function where up and down arrow will let you go up and down on these items. And the tab key, tab on your um, keyboard can be used to switch between these top items, top top, uh, top tabs, and enter key would select the item and uh, change configuration in here. As opposed to a UEFI type, it looks like this. This is the uh, ASUS UEFI. Um, I took it extracted out of uh, one of my uh, articles on my website on sanuja.com. If you want to uh, check it out, I you know just go to this website and you can check uh, what I'm talking about in here. Uh, and again, you know, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and thumbs up this video uh, so that you know uh, you get to my videos as soon as I posted them onto YouTube channel. And on here, uh, what you can see is that as opposed to a typical BIOS screen, the UEFI screen is graphical, right? So UV, UEFI screen is uh, graphical in a way that you, it also allows you to use your mouse to click on these items. 
you still can use the keyboard to um, jump around here in most uh, UEFIs, but it, it's much convenient to use a mouse and you can use the mouse to move around here and you can click uh, different items. Uh, don't look at these arrows because these are just, I'm just showing something for this particular article. Uh, but you can see my mouse right here. See that there's a mouse. You won't get that, get that mouse option with the BIOS screen. You do get it with the uh, UEFI, but not with the BIOS screen. You can see the mouse right here. So you can move around and click on it and then you can change this uh, different setting. So the boot priority, for example, if you want to change blue boot priority here, you had to go to uh, the, I believe the power option, uh, and then you had to go to one of these, um, uh, you know, menus and you had to click and you can select the priority, go up and down, move them around. But in here, if I had more than one hard drive, I can simply click on this one of these hard drive and move it around and then say save. And then that's it, that's the priority, one, two, three. So if you have three hard drives here, I can just move like this and move like this and move around here and it'll change it. But if you go to advanced mode in this in here, it'll have a similar options like this, but again with the mouse, you will have the ability to move around with the mouse. So that's what the looks and feel differences are typically. So boot options, boot prior, priority order. In the BIOS and UEFI boot setup menu, you can set the order in which the system tries to boot from certain devices. This is called the boot priority order or boot sequence. So for example, if you have multiple hard drives installed on your device, you can tell uh, which hard drive has the operating system and you can put that as the priority. So when your device boot up, that hard drive will be kicked into uh, action to give you the, uh, the OS boot up, right? So the brute priority order, um, the examples where you might need to change those brute priority orders, um, uh, like I mentioned quickly, uh, one of them is having multiple hard drives, uh, but uh, here are some of them that are listed here as well. So some distributions of Linux uh, can be installed on a USB flash drive, so you can boot the operating system from this uh, drive when you put the USB drive uh, first into uh, the boot priority order. So. That means you have a Windows computer or a Linux computer, doesn't really matter. But let's say you Ubuntu, for example, which is a Linux version, uh, you can be uh, boot from a USB drive directly. You don't need to install Ubuntu. You can have, it is called, it's called a portable Ubuntu. You can basically put a USB drive with the Ubuntu on it and you can boot from it. To do that, if you have a Windows machine or a machine with other operating system, you need to plug that USB drive and go to your BIOS and change the priority order so that the, it boot from the USB flash drive first. So the first thing gonna kick in is the USB drive, not the your hard drive. So that way you keep, will boot from that Ubuntu portable uh, operating system out of your USB key because that's the priority now. So when installing an OS, another option, uh, another reason why you need to change the boot order when installing an uh, OS on a hard drive, you might want uh, the UEFI to first boot from a DVD to install uh, from the setup. Or in 2022, you can get Windows 11 onto a USB drive. In fact, if you go and buy a Windows 11, it will come in a USB drive. So you need to insert that USB drive to your computer and change that order so that it will boot from that USB drive so that the iOS image in that USB drive will be used to install your operating system. Otherwise you will be going into a boot loop or a blank screen or you will end up in just BIOS screen because there is no operating system installed on your computer. So when you're first installing your operating system or you are installing a new operating system, you can set it up so that it will boot from that device with the operating system files on it. It could be a DVD or it could be a USB drive or some other drive as well. If you are installing an OS from a server, uh, PCI, uh, you can put the PCI LAN or uh, in that case EFI network option at the top of the boot priority and enable uh, PXE or PAX uh, boot uh, to LAN. So what that's going to do is the operating system is located on a server in an enterprise environment and you have multiple uh, computers uh, where you're going to be using that, that operating system image 
to install onto their um, uh, computer uh, those uh, you know multiple systems and in that case what you're going to do actually you're going to go into the bios or uefi and you're going to put set it to pex boot uh, uh it will be cie lan uh, ef uh, fi network connection option so that it'll boot from there group from the windows setup dvd to troubleshoot a computer that will not start so it could be uh, windows setup dvd or windows setup um usb key you can use that to troubleshoot a system that won't boot so you have had your uh, microsoft windows 11 working fine everything is fine but suddenly something goes wrong you can use your microsoft windows 11 original uh, keys so not the keys the original setup uh, uh, usb or the dvd to you know get back uh, into fixing it so if you end up with a boot loop or no not working properly or your computer suddenly restart uh, and you can't getting into um, you know the windows uh, um, uh, you know machine you would be able to set up a boot option so that you can boot it from that usb drive so that those are some basic example so i i don't i don't want to spend too much time on this slide just remember you can change the boot order for numerous reasons and these are some of them so boot options uh, include uh, something called secure boot which is another option available on your um, uh, uefi as well as uh, uh, bios options sometimes uh, so what does the secure boot do so secure boot was invented to help prevent malware from launching before the operating system and anti-malware software are launched. So remember, in order for your antivirus to work, your operating system has to be already up and running, right? So what happens if there is a malware or a some kind of a virus, uh, you know, some kind of a, a nefarious uh, script um, that can be injected before even the operating system boot up? well there is a way to do that there are hackers uh, bad guys who have done that so to prevent that from happening we use something called secure boot secure boot works only when the boot mode is uh, uefi not uh, C -A -A csm and uh, operating system supports it so that's one of the key things about secure boot so secure boot will, will only be supported in a uefi environment this brings into another key thing I forgot to mention previously that on my previous slide right here, I showed you that the difference between BIOS, typical BIOS and a typical UEFI. The reason why I use the, ter use the term typical because you could have a UEFI looks like a, a BIOS like this. It doesn't need to have graphical user interface, but it can, right? So in here, in this image, this is actually a UEFI, but it doesn't have that graphical nice interface, but that's fine. You still have the UEFI, uh, uh, you know, configuration supporting. And, and the secure boot options will be only be available in UEFI. Keep that in mind. The secure boot option will only be available in UEFI. And, um, you know, it is uh, supported by Windows 11, Windows 10, and Windows N8 and several distributions of Linux as well. Uh, and uh, Secure Boot holds digital signatures, encryption keys, and drivers in databases stored in the flash memory on the motherboard and or on the hard drive. So the Secure Boot can store the digital signatures, encryption keys, and the drivers in a databases, either on the, its flash memory on the motherboard itself or on the hard drive uh, or both. So they could have like the encryption keys and the uh, and the signatures stored in the motherboard, for example, and the drivers, uh, um, you know, in, uh, uh, stored in the hard drive. So you can do that or all in one place as well. And when enabled, it checks each driver, the operating system and applications before the UEFI launches these programs to verify it is signed and identified in the secure boot database. So that's how it prevents a malware uh, from being launched before the operating system kicks in, right? So it basically checks each driver operating system and the applications in the UEFI, uh, you know, that, that database before even the UEFI, uh, you know, allowing uh, the operating system to launch. 
So that's what the secure boot does. If you have secure boot options, which you should in most computers and servers um, in modern day, you should enable it. I don't know why, any reason why you should disable secure boot. You should have secure boot enabled on almost every single Windows 11, Windows 10, and Windows Server um, devices currently in use. And keep in mind the UEFI uh, has to be there in order for the secure boot to support because the UEFI is the only uh, you know uh, configuration that allow the secure boot. We can the all the BIOS software uh, firmware will not support uh, secure boot. So the next op uh, BIOS option uh, or UEFI option we're going to look at is a CS, uh, CSM and UEFI. So the boot screen allows you to select UEFI mode of uh, CSM, which is the compatibility um, support mode. Uh, what the CSM is basically doing is it's just allowing some features uh, uh, from BIOS um, for backward compatibility. So UEFI mode is required for secure boot uh, to be enabled. So if you use a CSM backward compatibility with all the uh, BIOS devices and drivers and MBR and hard drives, you may not be able to uh, turn on the secure boot. So if you switch your UEFI to CSM, which is a compatibility support mode, you won't be able to have the secure boot enabled because those features will be automatically disabled. If you want to enable secure boot, you have to use the UEFI mode and not in the CMS uh, configuration, which is a compatibility option. Keep that in mind. Configurations of onboard devices. Enable or disable some onboard devices using uh, UEFI setup uh, can be done. Uh, those include things like network ports, USB ports, or video ports. Uh, depending on the motherboard uh, devices, uh, uh, you know, onboard devices, the motherboard, uh, you know, configurations may differ. So some motherboards may uh, have multiple uh, network ports and you want to disable one of them, you can do it, but some other won't only have one network port and may or may not allow you to disable that port because sometimes uh, the uh, the the uh, UEFI configuration will prevent you from disabling as a safety or like a mechanism to prevent you from, uh, you know, disabling the only available port. So keep that in mind. So if you have like, for example, one LAN port, your motherboard uh, UEFI may not allow you to disable that LAN port. But if you have multiple LAN port, you, you may allow to disable one or the other. Uh, keep in mind uh, when it's come to the point, uh, uh, disabling and enabling components uh, on your motherboard. Uh, if you are in a production environment, especially in an enterprise servers with the enterprise servers and business servers, be careful of what you are enabling and disabling. For example, if you have a motherboard with RAID support and you start disabling stuff uh, associated with RAID on your UEFI configuration, you may not be able to recover that RAID card depending on the configuration. So be very careful of what you're disabling, especially when you're working in the enterprise server environments okay be careful what you are enabling and what you are disabling uh, when with respect to video ports um, most of the time in a consumer level if you have already a graphic card installed you may want to disable the video port uh, on your onboard uh, motherboard so that's why you might want to do the one option one area once to a one use case uh, scenario uh, for home use why you would want to disable certain things like disabling video onboard video port because you have a um, uh, graphic card installed. A little bit about overclocking. Um, is, this is not a separate slide, this is just in the same slide because it is part of a UEFI configurations. Uh, running a processor, memory, motherboard, or video card at a higher speed than the manufacturer recommended is called overclocking. And some motherboards and processors allow overclocking, but it is not recommended best practice. So enthusiasts like maybe you and I may overclock the, um, you know, the CPU and RAM, but it is not uh, always recommended. One thing I want to point out in 2022, you can buy motherboards from companies like Asus that allow safe overclocking. What it does actually, you don't even need to go to UEFI setup to overclock your RAM or, um, or your CPU. 
you will have a software on your desktop that would allow you to basically overclock your computer, uh, the RAM and the CPU. So there are safe overclocking options. For example, this computer that I'm using to present to you right now, it is a, a Intel i9 overclocked uh, under safe modes. So basically I used the uh, Asus uh, uh, overclocking software to overclock it. So you don't necessarily need to go to UEFI setup to overclock. In that case, it will be okay. So even though manufacturer do not recommend overclocking it, if you have the um, capability to safe overclock, it's okay to do that. I don't think that it's gonna create any problems. Uh, but however, overclocking manually in the UEFI configuration, use caution, right? Uh, remember overclocking also generate more heat. So you should have proper ventilation and maybe liquid cooling in order to um, do extreme overclocking. Security features. So next few slides, I will be talking about security features associated with uh, your motherboard. And uh, some of those security features include the power on passwords, the low jack and drive password protection, TPM chip and drive encryption. And we will cover them in the next few slides. The power on passwords. Power on passwords are assigned in the UEFI setup to prevent unauthorized access to the computer and or the UEFI or BIOS setup utility. Depending on the motherboard, it may be possible to set a supervisor and use a password. So especially with servers such as HP servers and IBM and Dell servers, it is possible that you can create a supervisor uh, BIOS or UEFI password and a user UEFI password or BIOS password. What it's gonna do actually is gonna create two different profiles. So it allowing you to give limited access to your IT technicians uh, for the UEFI and BIOS configurations uh, as opposed to supervisor. For home uh, desktop computers, you may or may not be able to create two different passwords. Um, but in that case, most likely you only can create the supervisor password where every single time you try to enter to your BIOS or UEFI configuration, the password uh, pop-up will come up. How you set up those passwords varies depending on your motherboard manufacturer as well as the BIOS or UEFI version. So please uh, refer to those manuals. The next item is the low jack for laptops technology. So the LoJack and Compute Trace agent technology are embedded in firmware of many laptops to protect a system against theft. Uh, however, it is a third party subscription based service and the service can be used to locate a, a laptop uh, whenever it connects to the internet. Uh, once located, uh, you can uh, give commands through the internet to lock the laptop or delete all data on it. So this is a service subscription based third party um, uh, uh, program. So it is not something like, you know, uh, universally available, uh, I would say, uh, because it needs to be properly set up and subscribe. And your uh, laptop has to have uh, that firmware embedded into the, uh, the motherboard in order for you to use it. So keep that in mind. Uh, I haven't used Logic in a long time, even not even corporate environment, but um, it is still in use. So it is something that you should uh, uh, be aware of. So the next one we're gonna look at is the uh, drive password protection security feature. Uh, in some motherboards uh, that allow you to, uh, to set a password in order to access the hard drive. So some motherboard will allow you to set a pass like a general password on the uh, motherboard in order to access uh, the uh, operating system drive, for example, and does not, however, it, however, this type of password does not encrypt data on the drive, but encrypts only a few organizational sectors. What that basically means is that that motherboard will prevent someone from ac accessing your hard drive by setting up a password at the very beginning, but not the hard drive data itself. So if I pull the hard drive out of your uh, case and plug it into a hard drive, you know, like an external hard drive reader, I should be able to read all the data on the hard drive. It just prevent 
the user from accessing the hard drive through your motherboard using that uh, you know password so it's, the data itself is not encrypted this is where the tpm chip and hard drive encryption come into play so the next security feature we're going to talk about is the tpm chip and the hard drive encryption because that is going to encrypt everything so many motherboards in 2022 contain a chip called tpm also known as trusted platform module it is a trusted a tpm chip uh, that allow a bitlocker type encryption tool in windows 11 windows 10 windows 8 windows 7 etc to work uh, with that chip uh, and an encryption key uh, which is the startup key is kept on that chip that module and assure that a drive cannot be used in another computer and can be used with other encryption software that may be installed on the hard drive other than the BitLocker itself. So BitLocker is one of those software that actually use that chip, but there may be other softwares out there you can use, uh, um, you know, you can utilize that TPM chip. And if the motherboard fails, and is replaced, you must have the backup copy of that uh, startup key to access the data on the hard drive or you can, won't be able to access it um, uh, in, in, any, in any easy way. So this is the most highest hardware protection that you can get, the TPM um, chip. So again, I'm gonna repeat that information briefly. Unlike a typical password protection, the TPM uh, chip type password protection will allow a hardware encryption of your data. Hence, without that password, you won't be able to access the data. And the Microsoft BitLocker encryption use that TPM switch, uh, sorry, TPM uh, tape chip uh, for uh, that purpose. And if you remove the hard drive from your ha uh, computer and plug it into an external hard drive reader, you won't be able to read any data because the TPM chip uh, trusted module is missing now, right? So that gives you a much better protection for your, uh, you know, data. So keep that in mind. And this is uh, the on the bottom of your um, screen. You see this, uh, this is an HP TPM chip. That's what it looked like. And this is actually a removable chip there where you can actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, add it onto a, uh, maybe a server board that does not have the TPM support before previously, but now want to include that. So you can edit that thing. So finally, this is something really important. Vulnerabilities of security features. Please keep in mind nothing is 100% safe. No security feature in IT is considered as 100% trustworthy. You have to do a risk versus benefit analysis and then based on that, you can, you know, based on that, you, your organization and the end user can decide what kind of security features will be uh, implemented. Remember the zero trust methodologies? those can be taken into account and consideration. Well, if you don't know what the zero trust methodologies, I will explain that in a different video. What that's basically mean is like a zero trust architecture in a firewalls, for example. What does that basically mean? You don't trust anything. You assume all, everything can have a malware. Everything can have be a hacker. Any data that going through can be coming from a hacking uh, uh, you know, a device, right? And then that's what we call the zero trust methodology architecture. Even Microsoft BitLocker can be with enough effort and uh, enough resources and money spent on, you can decrypt a Microsoft BitLocker encrypted hard drive with enough time, money and effort. So keep, keep that in mind. So nothing in IT is 100% safe. So all those security features on your motherboard uh, is never, consider 100% safe, okay? Keep that in mind. BIOS and UEFI set up for virtualization. So virtualization is when one physical computer uses software to create multiple virtual computers. I haven't covered virtualization uh, uh, on my uh, lectures yet, but I will do a separate lectures on those later sometime. Uh, so 
for now, what you need to know is a virtualization is uh, when you have one physical computer but use uh, a software uh, or a firmware, sometimes, sometimes call it, uh, when you have a type one virtualization uh, to create multiple virtual computers. So virtualization, but the primary purpose of the virtualization is to create multiple virtual environments for those virtual computers. So a virtual machine, which is known as VM, simulates the hardware of a physical computer. So the each VM works like a physical computer and is assigned virtual devices such as virtual motherboard and virtual hard drives and virtual network interface card and etc, etc, etc. So each VM will have virtual access to those virtual components when you create those VMs. Virtualization must be enabled in the BIOS or UEFI setup. Uh, and examples of virtualization in includes Intel VT, AMD V. So AMD V and Intel VT are virtualization uh, uh, you know, options available on motherboards. So the question is, should you enable or disable virtualization? I would recommend only enabling it if you use VMs even though it has no known major vulnerabilities and it has very low impact uh, on your uh, device performance, I would not enable it unless I really need it. So I have virtualization enabled on this machine. I saw no performance difference and I had no vulnerability issues for the last five years. So that tells a lot, right? That basically says, hey, really doesn't really matter whether you have the virtualization turn on. It's not just me, but there are hundreds of thousands of people across the world. Millions of people have there are some machines that with virtualization enables. And for to this day, the, there are no major vulnerabilities and the impact is very low. However, if there is no need to enable this feature, I would just keep it turned off because there's no need for it. As um, with respect to servers, uh, Almost all servers that I have worked with, the virtualization have been enabled. It is rarely you would find a server, especially enterprise servers with virtualization disabled. So keep that in mind. A virtualization is almost always enabled or it is enabled by default. Yes, yeah, there is no way to disable it in on servers, but on desktop machines, unless you need it, I would keep it disabled just because it's an additional thing. You don't need to have it turned on. Finally, uh, let's look at some uh, um, how you can save uh, uh, your BIOS settings, all the changes if you have made any changes uh, and how you can save those items, right? So when you're finished with the BIOS, you have UEFI uh, setup uh, and exit screen gives you various options such as saving your configuration changes uh, and, and while you're exiting or discarding your changes while you're exiting. So you can pick either of those options. And some of uh, uh, option to uh, load optimize defaults, uh, that means um, basically um, you go into the configuration, you may have saved some uh, options in, in your previous sessions. And this option uh, will allow you to set it back to uh, uh, some what we call the load optimize default or default options, right? So this option can sometimes solve problems when a user has made several inappropriate changes or incompatible changes in the UEFI settings, or you are attempting to recover from an error created while updating a, uh, the firmware, right? So these are good, uh, 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 this is a good option to set everything back to default or optimize defaults so that you can recover your um, computer. Motherboard drivers versus firmware. So this is a confusion that happens even at the highest level. I even seen network administrators and system administrators get confused sometimes, which shouldn't, but surprise, surprise, it does happen. So there's a difference between motherboard drivers and firmware. These are not interchangeable, even though in the field you may hear people, technicians may use uh, those terms interchangeably, they are not the same. So device drivers, which are sometimes part of the motherboard drivers, are small programs uh, that allow software to interact with certain software. So the device drivers actually have instructions on how 
uh, they should communicate with each other, including protocols, you know, things like that, protocols and configurations and everything that could be included in the device drivers. The CD or DVD that comes with the motherboard contains a user guide and drivers for its onboard components. Now, with new modern motherboards in 2022, those uh, drivers uh, and information may be contained within the motherboard itself in its chip in the in the memory or maybe uh, you may be asked to download it from a usb stick or you may be asked to download from the internet keep that in mind after installing a motherboard you can install the drivers from that cd dvd drive or the usb key or from the internet whatever you know your motherboard is supporting to update them by downloading uh, update from the motherboard manufacturer website uh, you know like i mentioned uh, before right so like it could be cd dvd drive uh, usb drive or update it directly from downloading from the manufacturer's website so that's how you can install those drivers so after installing your motherboard you're going to update those drivers Sometimes those updates are included in the Windows uh, updates. So when you are running Windows updates, the some of the motherboard drivers will automatically get updated. Be sure to correct, uh, you know, sorry, be sure to get the correct drivers for the operating system edition and type. So for example, Windows 10 64-bit uh, uh, drivers, um, it will be incompatible in most cases with Windows uh, 11 uh, 32 bit or something. You know, like if you have a Windows 10 32 bit uh, drivers and you are installing on a Windows 11 uh, uh, 64 bit, it's not going to work. Even within Windows 11 64 and 32, they may not be incompatible with each other. So you need to make sure that you are not only using the right drivers for your um, your uh, uh, motherboard component in built-in components but also you need to make sure you use the right drivers for your operating system so these motherboard uh, drivers uh, can be onboard uh, supporting uh, onboard usb 3.0 onboard pci express slots uh, onboard uh, ram uh, support sometimes have some drivers included in ecc rams for example uh, where there is uh, uh, server uh, ram management involved in it uh, so this could be onboard uh, uh, drivers but it also could be uh, you know drivers associated with components you are adding on top of to the motherboard such as it could be your gpu drivers right you insert a graphic card to your motherboard and that pci uh, uh, you know uh, uh, slot uh, you need uh, those drivers uh, updated so that it will work properly now firmware is different from device drivers Firmware also commonly refers to as the BIOS or UEFI. A motherboard firmware defines uh, how a PC turns on, which drives boots up from, and what kind of uh, component it's gonna recognize, and the frequency at which the CPU runs. So the heart or brains of the motherboard is the firmware. So the UEFI and the BIOS, which we discussed previously on the previous few slides, is basically a firmware. It is not a driver, it is a firmware. So keep that in mind. So now we're gonna look at how you can up, uh, you know, upgrade uh, firmware. So in terms of upgrading uh, or updating the firmware. Cautions to be aware of when updating BIOS firmware includes do not update firmware without a good reason. So if your computer is working fine and everything is going well and it meets all your needs and even go beyond your needs sometimes, there is no need to update your uh, uh, firmware or UEFI uh, firmware uh, just because of your manufacturer have released a new firmware. So don't update firmware without a good reason. And whenever it's possible, make sure you back up all your information, data, drivers, and everything before you upgrade your firmware. Select the correct update file. The last thing you need to do is right now is to pick a wrong firmware version or a file and try to flash it and successfully flashing it, causing your device to go pretty much corrupt, right? So please be careful with that correct firmware file needed to be used. 
don't interrupt the update so if you start updating your uefi or bios in the middle of that do not uh, uh, interrupt that process because that will result in corruption of your firmware and may not be able to recover it easily uh, or at all uh, in some cases so be careful with uh, firmware update this is where i recommend that you are using a ups uninterrupted power supply when you are running a firmware uh, upgrade uh, for your uefi uh, chipset uh, because that will make sure that you don't lose power during the upgrade process and uh, as such uh, there's a caution it is hard to recover from an upgrade failure or corruption when you are doing a uh, uefi or bios uh, from your update some other boards provide dual bios uh, uefi memory support um, so those uh, motherboards allow you to roll back uh, to previous uh, BIOS or UEFI firmware in a case of a corruption or incomplete uh, installation. Automated mechanisms uh, are sometimes built into those motherboards to bring the motherboard back online in case of a corrupt firmware or incomplete firmware upgrade. Uh, but sometimes um, you will get a message saying, hey, the firmware uh, upgrade, uh, the BIOS has failed. Uh, do you want us to load from the uh, the good uh, UEFI available on the other chipset, right? So keep in mind. So some motherboards, the newer motherboards with high-end, uh, uh, um, uh, especially high-end gaming motherboards, for example, uh, those gaming desktop high-end motherboard will have dual UEFI BIOS support, and that will save you a lot of time and a lot of headache with, uh, you know, UEFI upgrade failures. And... So these are the cautions and some of the options of rollback. And what about the reasons? Why you why do you even need to update the UEFI or BIOS? Well, those includes the system hangs at odd times or during boot. Uh, that may be because your UEFI or BIOS is corrupted or uh, there's a newer version is available that with more stability built into it by your manufacturer. So if your manufacturer highly recommend upgrading your BIOS or UEFI, because of it in significantly improved the stability of your motherboard. That's one of the very good reason why you should upgrade uh, your UEFI or BIOS. Uh, some motherboard functions have stopped working or are causing problems. That's another reason to maybe upgrade or even reinstall the same uh, firmware. Uh, you can, uh, you know, you may have got uh, errors uh, when trying to install a new operating system or hardware device. And when you check the manuals and options to uh, fix that, uh, one of the troubleshooting, uh, you know, um, option given to you is to update your uh, firmware. In that case, you do that as well. You want to incorporate uh, some new features in an uh, uh, on a new component on the motherboard so some motherboards especially when they first released uh, to the public may not have all the components and features enabled right out of the gate in that case you have to come home and make sure that you upgrade to the newest version of the bios firmware so those features get updated and sometimes this also happen uh, because the motherboard manufacturer do not have access to certain configuration of intel or amd processors or certain features of the uh, gpus uh, so they would release a new firmware update that you need to run in order to get maximum uh, uh, you know benefit out of those uh, new features that are available so those are reasons why you would want to update or upgrade your bios or uefi firmware the process of update, upgrading uh, or uh, refreshing the programming and data stored on the firmware chip is called updating firmware or flashing BIOS or UEFI or flashing BIOS. The most common term is flashing because it's basically flashing, the it's, it's removing the flash memory data and inputting the new memory data, new data into that memory, right? So that's why we use the term flashing. So most common terms would be flash, flashing BIOS or UEFI or flashing BIOS, but some people also still use the term updating or upgrading firmware. To flash BIOS or UEFI, always follow the directions found on the user guide or online manual or for your motherboard. And the motherboards can uh, use one or more of these uh, following methods uh, for uh, updating those uh, features uh, or uh, the updating that uh, firmware. 
So that includes the download and update from within the BIOS UEFI setup. So some motherboards have a, the option to do it within the setup itself of the BIOS. Update from a USB flash drive using a BIOS UEFI setup. So you go to the UEFI setup screen and you uh, pick the, your flash drive and you update from the file within that flash drive. Run an Express BIOS UEFI update. Uh, that is a software that can you can run sometimes to update it. Uh, it could be a graphical user interface software that run on your Windows machine that will download your BIOS, which I have it on my computer. And then when you reboot and it will automatically start updating your uh, BIOS. So there are some options available uh, for updating uh, your BIOS. So fail BIOS or UEFI upgrade. Oh no, that's the worst case scenario, right? Actually, yes, this is actually the worst case scenario because this is unlike operating system installation failure where you can simply reinstall the operating system. A BIOS UEFI uh, upgrade failure is a nightmare sometimes, it is a headache. So, but they do happen, right? So if you have a dual boot or UEFI support, you're good because it will just take few minutes to enter uh, auto recovery from the good firmware uh, or uh, you will be, uh, be presented with the menu to recover as I mentioned before. It will take a few seconds. But what happens if you don't have those newer fancy motherboard These are typically more expensive too with the dual uh, BIOS or UEFI support. In that case, what's gonna happen is you have the option to ship the motherboard uh, or the BIOS chip uh, to the manufacturer. So new motherboards, uh, basically there is a way to, you can pull out the chip. So chip will be seated on a uh, the, one of those uh, IC sockets and you can actually pull it out with a prying tool uh, and you can send that chip to your motherboard manufacturer. Uh, but before you do that, contact your manufacturer first because they might ask you to send the entire motherboard don't remove the chip and like i said it's the only newer motherboard that have that removable chips because some motherboards have already ma machine sorted uh, the chip onto the motherboard itself in that case you have to send out the entire motherboard anyway so you have to rma you have to send the motherboard back to your um, manufacturer the other option which is the harder route would be if you don't have the correct equipment and everything you need to buy a chip reprogramming kit and use that reprogramming uh, uh reprogram uh, you know you use that to reprogram using um, the manufacturer support site documentations and files now about that if you don't have a removable chip on your motherboard you won't be able to buy a reprogramming kit where you can remove the, uh, the that, that um, uh, you know uh, the, that uh, seated uh, chip from your motherboard and plug it into those uh, programming kit and reprogram right if it is machine sorted onto the motherboard you won't be able to do that but if it is uh, not machine sorted it, it is seated onto a that uh, you know that that uh, the, you know that sockets and you can pull it out from a prime tool and you can reprogram that chip so um, the finally, one more thing I want to point out, there is something called jumpers to clear BIOS and UAE FI settings. Well, about that. <clears throat> so in terms of jumpers, this will reset your UEFI BIOS settings, but it will not reset your, uh, you know, the BIOS firmware itself. It'll make sense when I go to the next uh, slide because I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Uh, but keep that in mind, the jumper clear does not going to recover you from a corrupt BIOS installation, okay? So why you want to, uh, uh, you know, do uh, a clearing of the BIOS uh, UEFI settings. So that's what we're going to talk about here uh, using those jumpers. So that includes the accidentally changing the configuration but could not roll back. Uh, could not access the BIOS UEFI for unknown reasons. So you're trying to get into the BIOS or UEFI screen, but it doesn't go there and it, something is wrong. Instability of the BIOS or UEFI, hence uh, could not save any changes. 
or you forgot the UEFI BIOS access password uh, or power on password, remember those supervisor password and the user password. And if you forgot both of them, how do you gonna access the BIOS? Well, you can do it with the jumper settings and flashing uh, BIOS UEFI fail, but at that this point, hopefully recover recoverable. You don't have to ship it to the manufacturer, okay? But it is rarely that happens. You know, if you actually fail flashing a BIOS or UEFI, I don't think the, um, you know, the jumpers gonna work. But insert you can try the jumpers. You can try the jumpers, like I mentioned here. You know, you can try the jumpers to clear it in a fail situation. But uh, it's not, you know, it's not always gonna work, right? Not always going to work. So a jumper. You might be wondering what is a jumper now, right? So the jumper is a two small post or uh, uh, metal pins that uh, stick up off the motherboard that is used to hold configuration information. And uh, you can use those, uh, uh, like you can connect those uh, posts. It's more than two posts actually. But how you're gonna jump is, uh, you're gonna jump two posts out of those posts. Uh, to do uh, to do the jumping like for example uh, open jumper has no cover and the closed jumper has a cover on the two pins so we'll have like in here we have six pins and you can put this jumper uh, across uh, those six pins in a certain configurations uh, so that you can clear uh, your bias settings so what pins to short out uh, on your jumper settings uh, is typically the same for most motherboards but could differ from uh, motherboard to motherboard and especially differ for the uh, what do you call the, for the uh, mm, uh, uh, server boards so keep that in mind for server boards the, these pins are maybe completely different from desktop boards too so i'm not gonna go over how the pin configuration works but i want to show you one thing uh, in the pin configuration picture this picture actually shows this uh, the, the chip for the uh, firmware bios firmware right here See that right here. As you can see, this is seated on on a socket. So this chip can be pulled out. So you can use a prying tool and hold it on those both sides and pull it out straight out, straight up, and it'll come off from this uh, seated uh, uh, you know dock type of thing. So that this is a removable uh, firmware chip. You can see that right here. So that's an example of a removable firmware chip. But if it is directly soldered onto the motherboard, no way you're gonna remove it. But this one, typically it is seated, but if it is not seated this type, you can. So it has a socket right here and the chip on top of it uh, goes into it and you can pull it out, right? And uh, right near it, you see those jumpers right here. Typically they are near the uh, chip. The jumpers are near the chip typically, but not always. So keep that in mind as well. Install or repair the motherboard. So motherboard is the heart or brains of the operation. Remember uh, from the very first slide, uh, but they can be replaced within few minutes to few hours by a qualified technician. So if you are a good IT technician, you should be able to replace it. Replacing tower desktop motherboards take less time than replacing server boards and laptops motherboards because desktop motherboards are the simplest form of motherboards to replace and that's why it takes less time. Proprietary form factor motherboards must be replaced with the same type otherwise it won't fit in there and the most cases support multiple form factors so you need to take into account that as well so if you can't find a certain form factor you may be able to get standoff uh, for the other form factor uh, install on the same case and install a different uh, form factor motherboard uh, but you know depending on your uh, cases but most uh, desktop cases would support multiple form factors unless you buy directly from you know dell or hp they might not uh, have that support because they are trying to stick you into that narrow lane right so keep that in mind uh, as well so uh, replacement in uh, you know we consider motherboard replacement a feel replaceable item even though it is the heart and brains of the operation and me take time to replace so just like a network interface card which is a easily feel re replaceable item the motherboards are also easily feel replaceable item so Here's a typical motherboard replacement, uh, uh, what do you call the workflow? 
and uh, um, this is not uh, exhaustive but this is what uh, we recommend in the a plus uh, certification program these are the steps that recommended by the a plus certification um, uh, curriculum so let's go over that quickly uh, so first thing we're going to do we're going to verify the right motherboard is selected uh, for replacement so that's the first thing we need to do get familiar with the documentation features and settings remove components to each or uh, to, to reach sorry to reach uh, your old motherboard so you need to unplug everything install uh, io shield uh, but keep in mind some motherboards may have integrated io shield as i mentioned in my previous slide so if there is a separate io shield you need to install the io shield first as soon as you remove the io shield and the motherboard for the previous motherboard that was there so the new one needs to be installed because so that way you don't forget install the motherboard so the next thing we're going to do you're going to drop the motherboard onto the case and install it with, the, with those screws install the process and uh, 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 sorry ins install the processor and processor cooler now this is what the a plus recommend installing the motherboard and installing the processor and processor cooler but in my opinion what i typically do i install the processor as uh, first and then install the motherboard i sometimes install most of the component outside the case before i install the motherboard but this is what the a plus certification recommends so i'm gonna give you both option for you so i would actually install as many components to motherboard as possible before i install uh, the step five which is to install the motherboard into the case so keep that in mind so if i'm going to do this even on a server board i install all the most of the components as much components as possible to that server board or the desktop motherboard first before i install uh, that server board or motherboard onto the case but however the a plus certification program recommends that you install motherboard before the processor and the cooler being installed uh, the when it's come to when coolers and um, it's kind of tricky to install it outside and and then uh, 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 put it into the case so you probably had to do it inside the case but some components of cooler such as liquid cooler some components the brackets can be installed outside the case then uh, inserted uh, the motherboard uh, with everything installed uh, already onto the case so keep that in mind then we're going to install the ram uh, we're going to install uh, all the cabling so the case switches the power supply so you're going to attach all of those uh, to, to the motherboard uh, we can install the video card uh, if there is a need for a video card of there is a video card uh, server boards typically don't have video cards uh, but when it's come to the point um, you know uh, the desktop uh, computers we are talking about desktop computers here so uh, we're going to install uh, the video card i will talk about the server board in the next few slides uh, so uh, then we're going to plug the computer into a power source attach the monitor keyboard and mouse and then we're going to boot the system and enter the uefi bio setup and we're going to observe the post a power on a self test uh, post uh, and verify no errors verify that the windows start with no errors install the motherboard drivers or upgrade the motherboard drivers because most motherboard drivers would come with the uh, drivers already uh, in for the in, uh, internal uh, components but you just have to may have to upgrade it but then you have to also uh, install and upgrade the drivers uh, for the components such as your gpus and any other external uh, items or internal items that you have added on to on top of the, the uh, motherboard such as a network card for example if you had an extra network card like a wireless wi-fi card uh, install other expansion cards and drivers that's what it says right here on the 15th which i just described verify that the system is operating uh, uh, properly makes final os uefi adjustments such as uh, setting power on passwords or any security features uh, low jack or anything that you want to set up you can set up at this point so here's a typical uh, server uh, motherboard replacement uh, so the same steps that i have described in for the desktop you can use for the uh, you know the installing a uh, server motherboard uh, but there are some additional things uh, associated with server motherboard that you need to uh, take into account that include uh, making sure to note the raid configurations hard drive base and label wires and raid card 
if there are multiple red cards when pulling out any of these devices because in red the order matters so some servers may require you to remove all hard drives before you can get to the motherboard screws so that means you maybe either remove the entire raid bay with all the red hard drives within it out of your you know your server case but sometimes you had to remove one hard drive at a time uh, to get to the screws and everything in that case please 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 make sure that you label the uh, those red cards and red hard drives and, and put it exactly how it is uh, how was uh, you know pre pre previously installed otherwise your raid might fail that's gonna be horrible in a enterprise or a business environment you're gonna lose everything you, even if you had backup it's gonna take time to bring those backup uh, into a um, production environment uh, so please make sure that if you have to remove red cards and red uh, hard drives you label them accordingly and put it exactly how it is and including those wires and everything the order matters if you are not in, uh, if you are not installing the exact same uh, motherboard check for compatibility issues before installing so if, if you're not installing the exact um, you know same type same um, um, motherboard um, version uh, and uh, uh, you know the type you need to make sure they are compatible with the components that you're dealing with the out-of-band management modules such as HP ILO and Dell IDOC modules may require reprogramming after installation onto a new motherboard so just like TPM uh, chips the IDAC uh, and ILO sometimes uh, those out of band management uh, modules have certain chip configurations that need to be reconfigured if you replace your uh, server motherboard because it's a security feature so make sure that you do those reprogramming and sometimes you have to recreate the ILO and IDAC um, for example uh, you know administrative passwords and usernames so make sure you follow those instructions if the process is time sensitive some server hardware components such as additional network cards additional storage may be installed hot that means basically um, if you are in a production environment and you can only have one hour of downtime and you don't have time to install everything you may be able to install uh, certain items uh, hot that means let's say if you have a backup raid uh, a card uh, you can install the backup raid card while the server is still running you may be able to even install all the other raid components on the secondary raid while the server is still running and the users are accessing and this uh, programs are running in the background so you can uh, do that uh, that's an option uh, available to you so you should think about that in a very especially the time sensitive situations server hardware components such as ecc ram is more expensive and sometimes even harder to find in some regions so pay attention pay attention to your surrounding be careful with the components because server components are more expensive and harder to find even in some regions uh, than desktop components especially things like ecc rams and server hard drives with high spin rates and enterprise grade components it, you know you don't want to drop a enterprise gate uh, hard drive on the floor and try to find that uh, you know that type of hard drive uh, you know uh, you know on on the internet and then uh, having a hard trouble uh, getting access to those um, you know hard drives sometimes so those ecc ram is uh, so expensive uh, uh, you know you um, you know you may not even have the budget to buy a new ecc uh, ram uh, module set uh, if you destroy the set that you already have so be careful with that uh, and again i will talk about servers and ecc ram and ram in general and all the other stuff in a separate lecture but keep that in mind when you're working with servers you have to be more cautious with your hardware with uh, servers more than the desktop uh, computers so let's look at typical laptop motherboard replacement so when replacing the motherboard on a laptop you may need to fully disassemble the entire laptop uh, because you need to consider alternative before like to just see if there is a way to get to the motherboard other than to disassemble everything uh, but you may have to an example of such is would be the macbook uh, motherboards uh, you have to sometimes access certain components through the uh, where the keyboard is 
So you had to remove the entire keyboard and the back panel to access all the components of the motherboard. Uh, there are some other manufacturers too. I believe some Asus and motherboard have the same problem. You had to remove the keyboard and the back panel to get access to all the, the screws and the motherboard components. So sometimes you had to disassemble the entire laptop in order to get to the motherboard, sometimes just the back panel. General procedures for replacing uh, a motherboard on a laptop include uh, make sure that you update the Windows and the device drivers and make sure uh, Windows is working properly uh, because <clears throat> remember uh, your laptop screen uh, have a driver right but you you're probably not going to replace the laptop screen you're just replacing the motherboard so make sure you run all the drivers or whatever the updates that needed to run on those things first uh, before you uh, put the new motherboard in because that might cause issues and then you had to remove the motherboard again uh, the new motherboard again and update the video drivers gpu drivers and put it back again because you are not going to see anything on your laptop screen uh, if the video drivers are not properly installed on your new uh, laptop motherboard because uh, you know the drivers are not up to date and you cannot connect an external driver in that case because it won't be able to do that either in most cases Disconnect the uh, uh, the power adapter and press F N S V. Those three keys. What that's gonna do is that's gonna set the battery in the ship mode, uh, and that will basically disconnect the battery and remove the hard drive uh, slot co comp uh, compartment uh, cover and the hard drive uh, itself. So some laptops may not have those compartment covers. Some do, uh, but if they do, just remove those. And next, remove the slot compartment cover that cover uh, that sorry that gives access to the memory uh, and uh, mini PCIe card, uh, and then remove those components. So any components such as the memory and the PCIe card, those can be removed. Then uh, remove uh, the keyboard bezel uh, to do. There's 13 screws typically, uh, and you can detach the keypad and the keyboard ribbon cable from the FPC, which is known as a flexible printed circuit connectors those are like basically flexible cables you see them on uh, uh, cell phones and laptops those are cables with wires on it but they are very flexible so that it can go uh, underneath uh, certain uh, uh, components and connect uh, different components together and uh, uh, you know to detach the system board uh, remove the five screws holding it in place then remove uh, six ribbon cables connecting the speakers hard drives optical uh, drives um, uh, usb ports battery camera lcd panel now uh, well uh, it may be five screws it, may, it could be 15 screws so it, depending on your laptop and it could be six ribbon cables or it could be even one ribbon cable depending on your laptop so this is just an example that uh, the a plus certification program has um, so you can actually remove whatever the ribbon cable so ribbon cables looks like these as i mentioned they are very flexible cables they are they, they contain wires uh, electrical co connectivity is there from this end to this end and those ribbon cables get attached to these connectors like these connectors so they are very low profile they are very flexible and it allow connection between communication between different components uh, just like shown here but again like i said it may not be six ribbon cables it could be you know one ribbon cable it, or 16 ribbon cables it could be five screws it could be 15 screws who knows so it depends on your laptop so take that into consideration whatever you do follow directions in reverse order to reassemble the system and when you are following those uh, reverse directions make sure that you put every component every screw uh, in the in back onto the laptop i see in situations where people take out all the components out of a laptop and put together everything and there's one screw out and they're like where does this screw goes well somewhere so maybe somewhere inside the laptop so make sure you follow them and follow it uh, in the proper order so make sure you uh, you know keep uh, keep tabs on you know the steps that you are taking to remove uh, this motherboard so that you can reverse it back so that when you uh, try to install the new uh, motherboard <laughs> And that would bring us to the end of this lecture. If you have any questions or concerns regarding any of the topics that I have covered today, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and I will get back to you as soon as possible. If you like these type of videos, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. And until next time, good luck and have a nice day.